Uh, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and you are watching Shrink Wrap Hawaii. And today, I'm delighted to say that I brought back my guest, Christine Heath. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Aloha. 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 So, um, for those that haven't seen our last show, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what you do and how it's different than most other psychological approaches to therapy. Okay. Um, the, we work from kind of an understanding we call the three, the, it's generally called the three principles. So what we kind of discovered was what are the fundamental principles that are the same for every person in how they create their experience of reality. And in doing that, we're looking at people as being mentally healthy and using their thinking in ways it wasn't designed for. So we're looking at helping people to see how to recognize how thought works, how their feeling is coming from their thinking, and how to live in a state of mind that's quieter and calmer, more peaceful, happier, more joyful. And that's the kind of the goal of, of our therapy is really to help people to regain that state of mind. So if I hear you right, what you're saying is that it's not about what's happening to a person. It's what they're creating from what's happening to that person. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's it. So somebody is going through a difficult time in their life how would the three principles techniques differ from somebody that walks into a typical psychologist's mm -hmm. office? Well, one of the things that I think is really different is, um, and I used to be a more traditional therapist, so mm -hmm. when people came in, I would talk to them about all the problems in their life to see how many they had, how long they had it, kind of like, and then start analyzing why they were the way they were as a result of those things that happened to them in their life. So. It was a lot of problem solving and it was a lot of analysis. So people, and myself, I did the same thing. I uh, analyzed why I was the way I was, which was very interesting, but I wasn't happy. Uh -huh. And so it's looking at not so much analyzing and problem solving because we would look at that as kind of being the byproduct of the state of mind you're in. Mm -hmm. We look at, tr at helping people change the state of mind that they're living in to help them get back to that natural, easy state of mind where we're able to handle life as it comes rather than being stressed all the time. Right. So somebody comes into my office and I can tell they're stressed. They're living in a very anxious, maybe a paranoid, to be extreme, mm -hmm. state of mind. Mm -hmm. How do we get them to change that state of mind? Well, it's not about, it's really you don't have to do anything to change the state of mind. You have to just stop, stop doing what you're doing that creates that more insecure state of mind. Okay. Yeah, but that so, reminds me of the old Bob Newhart. Did you ever see the Bob yeah, 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 where yeah. he goes, just stop it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's two things. One is it's recognizing, being able to kind of step back to see how is my thinking creating my experience. It's like whatever we're seeing, feeling, and experiencing is coming from the inside. We're not reacting to the outside world. So we're not like a photographer taking pictures of our life. We're more like a, 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 like a, 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 you know, a movie camera. And what we're seeing in our life is coming from what we're thinking. So it's an inside But the movie experience. camera's taking pictures of what's happening on the, in the outside world. No, no, I'm watching a movie. Ah. So we're, we're watching what's coming oh, from Oh, and so, so like that's why yeah. when you watch a movie with somebody else, you're really watching two different movies. That's right, that's right, that's right. And that's why when you start thinking about something, you start to see it everywhere. So if you, your wife gets pregnant, then all of a sudden you see all the other pregnant Everybody's women. Everybody's pregnant. Or if you buy a new car, <laughs> you see that car everywhere. Right. So it's looking at really how does, how does our experience get generated and then applying that to psychology or to counseling. So if we look at people as being born with an innate state of mental well-being, that kind of natural writing ability that fuels the resilience in people, then we're, we're pointing people towards that rather than pointing them to what they've created already with their own thinking. And that's kind of what analysis does, is we're looking at 
first of all people would come in and talk to me about how they saw life and i took that as kind of fact and instead of recognizing that what they were telling me was frequently coming from a state of mind that they were in so when people were in a really low state of mind they'd come and tell me how awful their spouse was right. and then the next week they'd come in they'd be in a better state of mind and suddenly all those things weren't a, a problem anymore right and i didn't understand that it seemed to me like i'd problem solve with people and we talk about things and then I'd see them the next week, and they didn't do any of the things we talked about, and they weren't in any better place, and now they had a different problem. So it was kind of always looking at why they're creating that. So what we do now is when somebody comes to see me, I listen to them. I, I, I really hear like what their experience of life is like. Not what I make of it, but I really try to hear that, and then help them to see how to quiet their mind and when we quiet our mind, we naturally kick into that natural state of mental health. So when people... How do we, how do we get them to quiet their mind? By listening. It's like when, when we listen, there's nothing to do to quiet your mind. That's the problem, right? So those of us that like to think a lot tend to try to figure out how to be not thinking. And that's, of course, ridiculous. You're thinking about your thinking then. So it's just a matter of seeing that's a natural reset that's in us. So when you like focus on get people to just listen and quiet down as they do. Now part of the thing is that I have to be coming from a calm state of mind. If I'm anxious, if I'm doing a lot of thinking, if I'm really stressed out in the session, I've got nothing to pedal. Right. So then how do you do that for yourself? Well, I really have been learning how to go deeper in my own understanding of the principles to live in a state of mental well-being. Like, I used to be so stressed out that I was going to get out of the field. I thought, you know, people would get better, but they weren't happy. And I wasn't happy, and none of my colleagues were very happy. And so I thought, you know, this is a bunch of crap, really kind of what I thought. <laughs> and, and so I just happened to go to this training, mm -hmm. and I felt so much better after I went to that weekend. I thought, well, if it doesn't, even if it doesn't work any better with clients, I feel better, and so I've got to do a better job of helping people. But you really can't teach people about mental well-being if you don't know how to get there yourself. Mm -hmm. So if I'm depressed, I can't really tell somebody else how they can stop being depressed, because otherwise I'd do that for myself, right? Right, and it's interesting because uh we got together on Sunday mm -hmm. and we chatted for yeah. a while, right? And then afterwards, uh, I was talking about it with my wife. And I said, yeah, she's great, but I think the problem is what I often run into with people who are great therapists. It's not about the theory. It works because there's something about her. There's this calmness and this almost hypnotic state that I feel like when I'm with her and uh, like you're saying you can't teach that <laughs> but you know before I learned this I wasn't like that I was absolutely maximum type A personality I worked 80 hours a week people were afraid to talk to me I was very angry I was very stressed out I was waking up every hour on the hour all night long I was not that person. But what happens to everybody, not me, just me, but that's the deal, is that when, when a person is that state of mind, then what happened to you happens to clients. But it, I make it really clear I'm not doing that to them. <laughs> yeah, but if I, I'm with some other therapist, it's not happening. So it must be you. No, it's, 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 it's me, but only because it's what I understand, what I've learned about, ah. see. See, if I hadn't learned this, I'd be that crazy person. I probably would have been out of the field by now. So then you're coming back again to the three principles. Yes. Now, is it a secret or are you going to share with everybody what the three principles are? I will, <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's, the three principles are mind, thought, and consciousness. And so mind is the energy that creates all things. So in order to have a psychological reality, you have to be alive. You have to be connected up to the energy that creates all things. That's why in the way I talk about it is that it's spiritual, but in spiritual I'm talking about understanding how the formless nature of life works through us. So first of all, you have to be alive. Right. Say. And so mind provides us with that natural state of mental well-being. So when babies are born, 
they cry and then they get a bottle and then they go there's a natural reset that kicks in so they move back into that state of mind then as we're we're is in a sense mind is what turns on your brain so it's like without being alive your brain doesn't think by itself Steve so mind, so mind is just energy yeah okay yeah w with an intelligence behind it that we would call like in animals we call it instinct in plant information we call it plant information mm -hmm. but it's that that intelligence of the universe if you will okay and we're all a part of that so that's what we get people to listen to is that knowing that they have the answers within them mm -hmm. and I don't have the answers for them so mind then breaks down into thought and consciousness consciousness is the ability that we have to see that we're thinking Mm -hmm. and that we're spiritual creatures. It's awareness, the ability to be aware of this room, to be aware of an experience. So when you've had a, like a surgery and they put you out, you come out of the surgery and you know something happened, but you don't know what it was because your conscious level was so low at that point that you didn't Oh, I mean, usually it. people say, did they do it yet? Right, that's <laughs> right, that's right. So consciousness is what kind of takes your life and br your thoughts and breathes life into them. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, and in fact, that's what creates our feelings. It's your thought is another spiritual gift because thoughts are these invisible things that we see the evidence of, but we can't see them right. except in our mind's eyes. So consciousness and thought work together and they create our experience moment to moment. So you said consciousness, part of what consciousness is anyway, is the knowing that we're thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, that caught me because I work a lot with, um, sometimes, with people with severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem is something they call, I, I, I don't know if I ever say this right, anasignosia, which is the fact that p most people with severe mental illness like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, do not have a, an awareness that they're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So that they don't have an awareness that the voices in their head are, n are only in their head. And without that consciousness, it's really hard to help anybody or for the person to get help. I mean, somebody wrote a book about it. It's called, I'm Not Sick, I Don't Need Help, mm -hmm. which is the first book that I usually give. I, I run a support group for people who are the loved ones of uh, those who are mentally ill here on Oahu. And I give everybody, tell everybody to get that book mm -hmm. <laughs> because their loved one is fighting with them all the time, mm -hmm. saying, I'm not sick, I don't need help. Mm -hmm. I'm fine, you're crazy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that that's not only true with people who are seriously mentally ill. It's true with most of us, is that we don't have the consciousness that our thinking is not right. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. <laughs> that I don't have to wash my hands a thousand times a day. Right. That that's just a product of the way I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you don't, you're going to get sick. Mm -hmm. but, but changing that consciousness is... No, 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 you can't change consciousness. Consciousness just is. But you can step back and understand how does it work? What's it doing? How does, what's happening to me? So when you do that, you start to see that consciousness is working with thought. So if you tell somebody that the voices in their head aren't real, they're going to tell you you're nuts because they can hear them. But if you tell I them, can hear this guy. And he's telling us we need to take okay. a break, All right. even though it's in my head. We'll be right back <laughs> with part two. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> my friend, Mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. That's What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, ah. yeah this is the starting line. Push. Ah. Ah. When this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. 
Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I'm still Stephen Philip Katz and I'm here with Christine Heath and we were talking about the voices in my head. Not the real ones. <laughs> Not the real yeah. ones. Yeah. Right. See, what happens when a person is, uh, has an uh, audio hallucination like that, what's uh -huh. happening is those thoughts get very real. Consciousness makes them real. And they're in such an insecure state of mind, such a stressed state of mind. And the way that uh, thought and consciousness work in those states of mind is that that's kind of what happens. People are not aware that it's coming from them at all. Right. So what, what I would do with that person is help them to see how thought works, not tell them that their thinking wasn't happening. Right. I'd help them to see that all that was was thought. And consciousness was taking what they were thinking and making it come real and seem accurate. And the more they think about it, the more real it gets. So then they try to manage their thinking, and that doesn't work. Right. See, it's like it, you get a shift in, in your awareness where you see that you're not your thoughts. Right. That this is just a, it's kind of like I, I often think of it as like, in fact, we were uh, using Siri to get down here today. Okay, and, and she said, you know, take H, H1. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. We're going to take Nimitz. And so, she, you know, she kept saying, no, go back to H1, go back to H1. <laughs> and I often think that that's like the thinking in my head. It's like we just get this idea in our head, and then it seems like it's like written in granite somewhere, that mm -hmm. it's the truth coming through us. With a capital T. Yeah, yeah. And, and that we're right, and that and when people will get very attached to their thinking. So by the time somebody's having hallucinations frequently, they've been having a lot of, um, they've been doing a lot of thinking, they've been very insecure about their thinking, and so by the time it gets to that point, they don't feel like they have any control over it. But that's just because they're trying to manage it after they think it. But so are you saying that what they need to do is to prevent the thinking in the first place? Well, if you change the state of mind you're in, your uh -huh. thinking changes without effort. Right. But then how do you do that? Well, you start to teach them how the principles work. Okay. And, and so you're talking in a really impersonal way. You're talking in a way that, and, and I, I'm, usually clients actually pick it up faster than therapists because they're <laughs> not, they don't have all these ideas already about how thought works or about what you should be doing, what it is. But you know, for me, I did a lot of negative self-talk in my head, a lot mm -hmm. of it, and it felt to me like it was God talking. Like somehow those thoughts were more credible, they were more accurate, they were more truthful. And so I would listen to that. I would listen to my thinking. Now when I get those thoughts, i like, oh, I'm in kind of a low mood right now. Okay. So when you say more accurate, more truthful, what do you mean more accurate, more truthful than what? Than any positive thinking, than the opposite of that. Ah, the only thing you can believe is the negative stuff. Right. Yeah, and I, I, sometimes I tell clients that, that in a way some of that negative stuff we're hardwired with. Like if somebody says to you, like if I say to you, that's a beautiful jacket. You're going, if you're like a lot of people, <laughs> you're going to just take it in and let it go. You know, for whatever reason. It's like, maybe, be, but if I say to you, ooh, who did your hair? You're never going to forget that I said that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Until we die. Yeah. And now, even now, even though I just made that up, right, yeah. you're probably going to think, ooh, was he serious? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you won't because you have this background. But somebody once told me that the reason that we do that is, as animals, we are much more attuned to threats than we are to compliments, which are harmless, right? And he, uh, the metaphor he uses is if there's a whole bunch of sheep and some other sheep walks by the flock, people might say, okay, here goes another sheep. But if the wolf walks by, is like everybody's on high alert. 
for good reason. Mm -hmm. Because people that give us negative comments are a threat. And we are hardwired to pay attention to threats. Well, the thing is, is that what you're seeing as a threat is coming from how you think about that. But sometimes a threat, you know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean nobody is following you. But a wolf is a threat. A wolf would be a threat. Right. But what, actually, what happens when we react from genuine fear, like my life is being threatened, that's right. a different feeling right. than when we're anxious. Yeah, like or, the example I gave you the other day where, like, somebody almost crashes their car into your car, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. First we get scared, mm -hmm. then maybe, if you're like me, you get angry, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then what? Well, then you either keep thinking about it and stay angry, or you stop thinking about it and right. think about something else. So mostly that's what I do, but some clients don't. Right. They relive it and relive it and right. relive it. Because most, a lot of people don't know that everything they think isn't a good idea. A lot that. of people don't know that everything they think isn't true. I mean, like, I, have ha I get the wrong thought frequently. A lot of times I'll think, like, oh, I should go do this, and then it turns out to be like, no, I shouldn't do that, I should do this. So everything we think of isn't like, it's not God talking to us, it's not like our higher intelligence, it's just our brain. And our brain, is, to me, is like artificial intelligence. It's only as good as it's been programmed. And so whatever you've picked up along the way, whatever you've programmed in, whatever you've thought along the way, that becomes the, the information that you're using to tell yourself about life. So client comes in, I'm having a lot of problems with my wife. Uh, it's really gotten horrible. And every day I wake up not knowing if I should go or if I should stay. Mm -hmm. What do you do as a therapist? Well, I would probably tell that person that I didn't know what they should do. Right. And, but I did know that if I got helped them to get in a really good state of mind where they were really at peace and, and in a very loving place, that their wisdom would direct them on what to do. That I would also probably talk to them about how they're trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. And their thinking is probably what's causing what they see as problems in their life. So they're going to the same thinking mm -hmm. to figure out the problem that's creating it. So my teacher told me once, he said, Chris, it's kind of like jumping back in the shower to dry off. <laughs> you know, so it's like, to, people do this all the time. They go on vacation, they clear their mind, and then they see things differently. Right. They have new insights. So or you get a good night's sleep. <laughs> you get a good night's sleep, and your mind resets, and you're in a better state of mind, and you see life differently. Right. So that's kind of the deal, is we're helping people to see that they can see life differently. Yeah. And when they do that, they'll have their own wisdom and their own ideas about what to do. Because, I, I mean, I really don't know what anybody else should do. I, I'm, I have lots of thoughts about what they should do. And frequently, I think they're good thoughts, but I really don't. And it's not my job to tell people how to do their life. It's my job to help them get into the optimal state of mind that they can be in, from which they make the decisions in their life. So meditation is very popular now. Mm -hmm. Is that one way people can get into a better state of mind? Sometimes they can. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with people that meditate a lot, and they're still pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, is, it's like when we meditate and we take the opportunity to quiet down, the mm -hmm. reason that people are drawn to that mm -hmm. is because they either know they're thinking too much and they know that the answer to that would be to quiet down, or because it, they can feel that when they do it, they feel better. So again, that's why when, when, when people go fishing mm. or they play golf or, yeah. and they get into this really beautiful state of mind, then they unfortunately frequently will blame it on what they're doing. But if you can teach a person that that's who they are, that's what they are, so you can find that state of mind anywhere. It's not about the outside world. When you say that's who they are, you mean the person that they are when they're fishing or playing golf or going for a walk? or Yeah. That's your, well, if you get into a sta good state. Yeah. I mean, you can yeah, do yeah. those things and be totally nuts. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that if you get a good feeling from it, right. if you get that calm, peaceful 
secure feeling. Is that, it's hard to describe it, but people know what it is. I know what it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that feeling is innate in all of us. And the only thing that happens is we just stop processing our life. We stop going on and on about what's wrong or what we're going to do or what we're afraid of. And when we stop doing that kind of thinking, we automatically move into a healthier state of mind. So you gave the example of the happy babies mm -hmm. before. But I'm thinking that anybody that's had kids or been around kids know that some, you know, people come out differently. Yeah, they do. You know, with somewhat of a personality. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? Well, I, I mean, the way I understand this, I mean, I, I haven't had a conversation with anybody higher up than me in the, <laughs> in the spiritual ladder, but uh, I just think that, that people come out at different levels of awareness. Mm. So, so some people come out and they're more negative, they're more insecure, they're doing a lot of thinking, and, and then they frequently have parents that do that, and so that's where we... Do, we learn our thinking from, right? So we mm -hmm. kind of move into that same world and and that becomes familiar to us. But we could still, I mean, apply the three principles. Yeah, but you can change. You can, you can, anybody can live in a healthier state of mind. Everybody can. can no yeah, matter. because almost all of us sometimes are in a healthier state That's of right. mind. That's right. Even people with the most severe diagnosis. Right. That's sometimes right. they're better. That's right. So it's teaching, see the thing is we usually, at, with people like that, we take those times to tell them they have a chronic illness they'll never get over. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the deal is, is to show them no matter how few those moments are that they can live there more of the time. Right. So then the process is learning to stay in that state of mind more of the time, starting to recognize how thought works to take them out of that state of mind, how their own insecure thinking just tricks them. See, thought just creates an illusion that the outside world is causing how we feel. Mm -hmm. But how we feel is only coming from the thinking we're doing. So consciousness and thought create what we call feelings. Feelings aren't like little varmints that run mm -hmm. under your skin and mm -hmm. come out at certain times. They come times. from our thoughts. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just really you are feeling your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so whatever you're feeling is just being brought to life with consciousness. So I don't know if you can feel it, but they just told me that we're done. Okay. And uh, we could go on for another right. six hours, yeah. I'm sure. So thank you for joining us at Shrink Wrap Hawaii. We'll okay. see you in a couple of weeks or whenever you want to watch it again. Bye-bye.